you're coming home from a wedding, a portrait session, maybe street photography, just like this right now, and you're feeling excited. Then you get in, you dump those images into Lightroom and everything like this. When you want it to feel like this, yeah. I get that. We need to make Lightroom fast. Maybe it's how quick your previews and your ratings are. You can't sort through. Maybe it's how quickly you're loading things up in the develop module. Maybe it's those masks and that AI. You put on those speed masks, it's like walking through a mud bog to get anything done, to move to the next image. People usually talk about the settings inside Lightroom, and those are important. We're gonna talk about those today, but there's also a lot of settings outside of Lightroom that affect what goes on inside of Lightroom. I really felt this when I was doing the video and the update last week to the Elegance 4 speed masks. As powerful as they are, I was like, man, I need to do some tune-up here. It's time to make a video about Lightroom speed. So as soon as we get back to the studio, I'm gonna show you how to fix it because it's not as complex as you think. In today's video, we're gonna break this up into three elements. The second is we're gonna talk about external settings to Lightroom. Then we're gonna finish in the third with some advanced settings. Here we are in the library module. Here you import things, you bring stuff in. Let's start right from the beginning. When you import photos, if you're having trouble in the library module, it's probably something to do with previews. But one thing you wanna take note of is how you build your previews. If you do minimal, they're going to be small previews without much information. Embedded and sidecar previews lets you create previews, but it also lets you load the previews that are embedded in the raw file. If you're in a workflow situation or in the field or wedding, sports, journalism, and you need those previews to load stat. So I'm generally gonna build standard previews when I come into Lightroom. Sometimes I'll build one-to-one, -one, but usually I'll do that on individual situations where I really need those large previews. Now we're still in the library mode, and if you look up here, it says I have the original photo, but I can build a smart preview to allow for offline editing. I don't usually offline edit, so that's never been a huge priority for me, except what happens with smart previews is you can actually get things to move faster. While you may not save those forever, let's say you're importing a wedding or something like that, it might be worth it to build your standard previews and your smart previews, walk away for a snack, and let those previews build. If I look here and just click the space bar, and let's start flipping through fast, and you can see at first it's pretty good, and then we're lagging a little bit because it's having to load those previews. I've built the standard previews, and these are loading pretty fast. You can always go to library and previews, and here you can change a group of images and what the previews are. You can build previews and make sure your previews are up to date. Let's say you're going to a client presentation or something like that. Let's build smart previews. Now if I select a photo, it says original and smart preview. Let's load these up now that the processing's done and flip through. And there's still a slight delay here because it still has to load the smart preview into the system. but it does feel a little snappier. It's really important that things are snappy when you're editing throughout Lightroom, and that's why this video is important, and I hope you watch it all the way through and change these settings, and let me know your tips in the comments. And please like and subscribe if you wanna see more like this. Maybe we'll make this an annual video. Building those smart previews can take just a shaved nose off it, but what smart previews also do is they go beyond the library module. Let's go into the preferences of Lightroom and look around real quick. The main one is in the performance tab. You wanna make sure your graphics processor is on if it's available. So you wanna be into auto or custom. Here I put it in custom just so I can see exactly what's going on. I have a graphics card here, a 1080 Ti 11 gigabytes. Now, a few years ago, this was a top spec graphics card. It's not anymore. It's still a good card, but I wanna make the point here that I'm not using the absolute top of the line. You may have saw me complaining in last week's video about the masks that can be so slow. In fact, that's what inspired me to dig deeper and find more options for speed because I was like, even on my good system, these masks are bringing Lightroom to its knees. This isn't okay. Sometimes Adobe or others will recommend that you turn this off if you're having problems, but I would pretty much do that just to test because especially with more advanced things like AI masks, 
it's going to really bog down because it's putting all that weight on the processor. It slows me down a lot and I even have a very good processor in this because it really doesn't use all those 16 cores most of the time. Another common tip you'll see is turning up your camera raw cache and your video cache, but mostly we're talking about images. You can turn up the cache size. The default is five. If you got the disk space, give it some room to breathe and build those cache so you have less loading times. This brings us to a very important thing. Look where I've put my cache. It's on the L drive. And we're going to come back to that in our outside Lightroom tips because the speed of these drives is really important. There's some things that you're just not going to be able to change. If you're barely above system requirements in Lightroom, things are going to struggle a little bit. So try to get as powerful a machine as you can for your heavy lifting. But there are some things you can change. You can disable the preview of Lightroom presets. So for example, let's say I'm editing in here and I'm in Filmist and I'm browsing over all these different films. It's pretty snappy now on my machine after my optimizations, you don't see a lot of delay. But if you're dragging here to the point where it's not even really helping you, it's okay to turn that off because obviously there's processing having to go on. When that option first launched, almost all of us turned it off because Lightroom was even more inefficient in those days and it was just a dog to use it. I think that was like Lightroom 7. So you have that option to turn those off. Now here's another option. Remember we built those smart previews. You can turn these on and use smart previews for editing instead of pulling it directly from the raw file on the disk. This can be really useful, especially if your cache is on a fast drive, but your giant raw files are on a traditional spinning drive. But in any case, it's worth trying this. I always resisted this because I'm like, no, I want my originals. But you can still zoom in one to one and see your original. And of course, when you export, if your file's online, it's exporting from your full quality original. I have this smart preview option. Is you may notice when you're flipping through images in the develop mode, especially if you've got masks and things like that, Develop is always a little slower. Notice how everything's grayed out for a second. As I flip through these, it takes just a second to run through and process everything. If you're trying to browse through fast to do your grid edit, for example, to rate your images on their initial import after you've built the previews, make sure you're in the library module because it's vastly snappier because it's not loading all that develop information. But you still want to be as fast as possible when you get into the develop module. And so having those smart previews loaded can also shave a little bit of time on that. Of course, other in Lightroom settings are things like optimizing your catalog now and then, again, checking your cache, things like that. You can also go to your catalog settings and find a few more preferences. Here you can control the actual preview size. Generally, this should match the size of your display, but obviously a bigger preview is going to take more time to load, etc. I usually leave this on medium, but you do have some control if you're having performance issues. You can also check things like making sure automatically write changes to XMP is turned off. Usually it is, but it could have become turned on and that can definitely slow things down. That's saving out XMP sidecar files if you need to sync them with other programs or something like that. Most people don't need that. Another thing to watch for that I've felt like it slows me down is if syncing is turned on. You guys have seen some of my videos where I'm showing using Lightroom and Lightroom Mobile. And so I've showed you in other videos how I have some collections that are set to sync with the Lightroom Cloud. Normally I'll ignore this, but if I'm in work mode and I really want everything optimized, I might pause the syncing for a while. I've actually noticed that syncing feels like it bogs things down sometimes. All of these little optimizations and settings add up. And a lot of what we just covered is what you see covered in most Lightroom optimization videos. And most people just stop there, but there's actually a lot more and that wasn't enough for me. I've been doing a lot of advanced masking. I've been showing you guys this in my recent videos. I've been doing updates for my Elegant Speed Mask pack. So with a speed mask, let's say I can come in here and I can have a develop preset that applies like 10 different masks, AI tools all at once. I could do them in batches, I can do these combinations and it's gonna apply all my masks ready to go with settings predefined that are ideal for the situation and then I can adjust those settings. Sometimes just clicking the preview to globally turn your masks on and off will delay a few seconds. And you may have noticed this on your own system that you don't even want to use masks because they bog everything down. I do recommend putting your masking last so you can dial your photos in with things like your presets and your manual settings and your crops and your grid edits like I show you on this channel. Then you can mask and do AI retouching and glamour retouching and things like that. Get it the way you want 
and then just paste it to the rest of your images. You can do amazing things with masks. It's like 10 times faster with speed masking because it's building them all for you. I'll put a link to last week's video in here where I'm showing you not only how I use the speed masks that I make, but how you can make your own and just how they work. But sometimes these things have 10, 12 masks. And you can see that I'm working pretty well here. I can turn the preview immediately on and off. Here's another test I do where I'll select like the background layer and then I'll go and I'll go up and down with it, right? And see how quickly and response it is, how quickly it's refreshing. At this point, you really want to start analyzing system resources. Look at your RAM, see how much you have, have as much as you reasonably can. If your RAM's maxed out, maybe you're still struggling, maybe you're maxing out the RAM and you're on a laptop, make sure you have a fast SSD. Remember when we were in the preferences a little while ago, it, asked, it showed where the cache was. Go to that drive L. You can see this is called Snap, which I believe this is a one terabyte drive. So I couldn't possibly put all my images on there. Right here is my main Lightroom catalog. In fact, also in here is my main Capture One catalog. I keep them both on this Snap drive. You can see I have my catalog files in here, and here's all the previews, the smart previews, the caching, all that stuff is right here. This stuff can take up quite a bit of space and I want it on a completely separate drive, preferably an internal SSD, but at the least the fastest USB 3 SSD you can get. And if possible, I want it on a secondary internal SSD, not my system drive. If you have a fast SSD in your system drive, an M2 kind of thing in your laptop or your desktop, it'll work. But if you can put all this caching stuff on its own drive that you use for that purpose that's also plugged in to your motherboard kind of drive, that's going to be amazing. And when I switched to this method, it helped a lot. If you go here, here's my main drive right here. And if I right click this, let's look at the properties of this. You can see that this is a 20 two terabyte, this is a RAID spinning drive array and I've got it about two thirds full. This is where everything ever is stored and then that drive is backed up to cloud services like crash plan, backblaze, something like that. I don't even trust my RAID and if the only backup you have is sitting right there in your office, you're not really backed up. So let's say I'm in Lightroom and I want to zoom in all the way on this 40 megapixel file. It has to build out the latest one-to-one -one preview and for that it has to access the actual physical spinning hard drive. Obviously that's going to be slower. The point is that while the files are on that spinning drive, it's not that it's particularly slow, but I don't want my catalog and my cache on that. That alone, if you're having problems browsing through just with general load time, this should be fast in here once your previews are built, right? Sure, it'll glitch up every now and then, but if this is slow, figure out where you're storing those previews. In my case, I have an NVIDIA 1080 Ti, so I'm gonna open this NVIDIA G GeForce Experience. Whatever graphics card you're using, you wanna figure out what controls its drivers, where do you update them, maybe you're using an AMD or something like that. Look at your drivers. With NVIDIA, at least you have a studio driver as well as a game ready driver. The studio driver, as I understand it, is a little more methodical and slower to update than the game driver, and it tends to be a little more stable. Normally, I'll run the studio driver, but if I'm having flickering and problems, I'll switch it over to the game driver just to see if it improves. And there has been times in certain apps where it did improve with the game driver over the studio driver. The other thing you wanna do though is go to the home screen if you're in NVIDIA and there's actually the apps listed here. You can see that I can click on Lightroom in here and I can go and optimize this app here to optimize Lightroom settings for the best performance. If you're using another brand of card or an Apple or something like that, you want to make sure that whatever control tools you can install for your graphics card are installed and make sure your graphics cards are kept up to date. So things outside of Lightroom, making sure your hard drives and your solid state drives are where they belong and that you're putting things in the right place on the fastest drives you can get them on, especially the catalog. Checking your drivers and making sure they're up to date. Checking things like your RAM availability. Also checking your drives and making sure they're not completely full. I will sometimes go into that L drive because it's only a one terabyte drive and the caches start filling up from Resolve, from video editing, from Lightroom, from Capture One, and I'll start deleting 
things from those caches because the cache is not your original files. The cache can always rebuild. In fact, as you saw in the Lightroom preferences earlier, you can go in and purge the cache and clear it out. Another thing you may not be looking at is it's not all GPU, it's processor also. So if you're using a desktop, let's say, and you have a Ryzen, you might be able to do something like Ryzen Master and do a little bit of overclocking. So I'll put my system into auto overclocking mode when I'm doing heavy work, and it'll just go through and kind of overclock it a little bit. Not enough that things start crashing and stuff like that because it's managed by AMD's own app. Let's close it out with a few more advanced tips that you can do. But there's one other big thing that people don't usually think about, and that's cooling. Now, you may have noticed even halfway through this video that the fans got a little louder, but they didn't do that automatically. Most fans, if they're left on auto for both CPUs and GPUs will kind of still just not push it to the max. In the case of my EVGA NVIDIA card, I have this EVGA Precision X1 and I can actually load profiles and save things and stuff. So I can actually use this again to kind of do an auto overclock mode of the graphics card where it optimizes it and I don't have to get too nerdy about those settings. But the other thing I can do, and even if you don't want to touch overclocking, crank those fans up to 100, okay? And there's different ways you can do this depending on depending on what system you have, what graphics card, what processor, whether you're Mac, whether you're Windows, there's gonna be different ways, different fan controllers. Here's what I wanna show you. Look at the screen right now. I'm gonna go into the develop module in Lightroom and in this portrait, I have a bunch of masks on. And heat is a big deal that photo nerds don't talk about that much when they're talking about optimizing Lightroom. You need to get your heat down. I have a very open case on my desktop machine. Maybe Maybe you're using a laptop or something like that. I've gone in numerous times and upgraded the fans, put bigger Noctua coolers in. These kind of things can actually make a lot of difference in performance on your CPU. Your graphics card, you can't normally directly add a fan to, but you can add more air ventilation to your case that's cooling down that air. The graphics card is at 60 degrees Celsius right now. The more heat, the less efficiency in electronics. If I go into my background layer, I'm gonna start just moving exposure up and down, right? So I'm making it work. Now the fans are on, auto here and they're not very high. You can see the temperature start to increase a little bit. It's not going through the roof. Now we're up to 63, 64. Now I want to show you something though. I want to come over to this graphics card and you're going to be able to do something like this whatever machine you're using. And I'm going to turn both these to 100. Now you probably just heard the noise, the ambient noise in the room. Watch the temperature of the graphics card. Now let's go over to Lightroom in tandem. And again, I'm going to start working, tweaking that exposure up and down and just playing with those masks in a way that starts straining the system again. Yeah, we're actually still dropping even though I'm doing this stuff over here. And now we're trying to hover between 53 and 54. By turning the fans to 100% on my particular graphics card, I got about 10 Celsius different. It's gonna help graphics cards if you can lower CPU temperatures. And there's apps you can install to monitor all of this and you can get as nerdy as you want with it. Then you can go even further. And I know a lot of you use NVIDIA cards. You can go into the NVIDIA control panel. And even if you're using another brand of card, there's gonna be probably some kind of control panel on the system that lets you do settings, like 3D settings. You could actually go to program specific settings. So I'm not gonna mess with all this. If you search on like YouTube for your type of graphics card, your model of graphics card, and Lightroom, you're probably gonna find some tips related to it where you can see people suggesting optimum settings. In these bold settings are things that I've changed. So let me just scroll through slowly. It may be different for your graphics card. However, my basic NVIDIA control panel settings are as follows. You can see that I've selected Lightroom, and these are my Lightroom specific settings, and you can go through and you can see each setting that I have going down this list and changing these around. And I come in and play with these. If I'm like, no, it's still not quite right. I'll just tinker around with these a little bit. And you're not changing the global settings. Obviously don't come in and change too many advanced settings if you don't know what you're doing, but it's certainly reasonable to go in and watch like a video for your graphics card and say, no, these are the settings I like for my Lightroom. See if you get a little bit more performance out of it. Whether you're in develop module, whether you're doing advanced masking and you wanna be able to quickly work with those masks and have quick responsive lists like this, this is what I wanna see. If there's a lag when I'm editing and everything seems to be kind of slowed down and maybe it's just a little bit, but you always feel like there's a lag, it actually starts making you, I think subconsciously feel like you're the one that's slow and you can't get it right. But it's actually your system that's stressing you out. And so optimizing for this makes a big deal. I come back to my system every now and then and do optimization like this because I know it needs it. 
And every time I do, it gets better. This time I did a lot more of a deep dive and got into a lot more settings and got outside of Lightroom into those more advanced settings. And I hope that helped you because I know it helped me. Of course, things like not having a bunch of extra apps open when you're in work mode in Lightroom, that kind of thing, not playing 4K YouTube videos in the background. Please like and subscribe. And of course, you can check out all my products like Elegance and my presets and things like that to support the channel over at Sime Effects. Com. Let me know in the comments your tips. And if you put all the tips I gave you today to work, I'm pretty sure your Lightroom is running faster. Let me know how it worked for you and enjoy that extra free time. Peace out, guys.